morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Just gonna get myself situated here. All right. Um, I'm Kevin Montano. I'm gonna be teaching the first session this morning, which is entitled Lodge Management. All of you are here because you have an interest in being leaders in your lodge. You want to be members of the LEC. You may want to hold a committee chairmanship. You may want to be a leader in your chapter, or you may aspire for higher things like being a lodge chief someday. So before you can take on a leadership role, you kind of you have to have an understanding of what the lodge is and how it works. So first, I'm just going to put up my contact information. I am Kevin. I am the Section NE3B Vice Chief currently. I hail from Gahunga Lodge, which is just about an hour away in Utica, your uh, neighboring council. And my contact information is up there. So if you want to contact me after this session, if you have an interest in you know, talking further about this, I have a lot of things I can share with you to help you succeed. I was a past Lodge Chief. Before that, I was a, um, a Lodge Secretary. Ceremon I started out as a Ceremonies Chairman. So I have a lot of experience as a lodge officer, as do the rest of our trainers today. So feel free at any time when we're not in a session to ask questions of us, to you know, ask us for suggestions or ask us for help, share your problems. We're here to help you succeed. I highly recommend you take out a piece of paper and a pen, or if you want to take notes on a computer or a tablet, take notes. There is some information here you're going to want to remember. So, starting off here. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Does anybody need paper and pen? Okay, so actually before I talk about our objectives today, I want to find out what your expectations are. Some of you may have questions or ideas. Do you guys, what are your expectations for a session entitled Lodge Management? What do you want to learn? What would you expect to get out of this? How to manage a lodge. Okay. What else? Skills to lead successfully. What was that? Skills to lead successfully. Let's see if I have a better marker here. There we go. What he said was uh, skills to lead successfully, how to be a successful leader. Anything else? Okay, no problem. So our objectives today, to understand what a lodge is and how it works, to review the lodge organization and structure specifically for your lodge, to identify the impact of communication on lodge operations, and to learn how to manage your time. All of these things play a key part in lodge management. So, let's start off with what is a lodge? Now, who here has any ideas what a lodge is? You know, give me your, if, you, if someone asked you what is a lodge, what would you tell them? Come on, somebody has to have an idea, I have candy. And whoever answers my question gets candy. And a patch. This is, that is a nice patch. So, a group of airmen coming together. A group of coming together. Well, the of, of Boy Scout Council. I like that. That is very good. Give him a patch. Yes. That is excellent. Repeat that so everybody can hear that. A lodge is the equivalent of the OA equivalent of a Boy Scout Council. That is spot on. What's your name? Matt. Matt? Yeah, Matt is totally right. The Lodge is the equivalent of a Boy Scout Council, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes when we get to how things are structured. But first, I want to talk about the mission of the Order and the mission of the Lodge. So, if we can go to the next slide. Would someone like to read the mission of the, lo of the Order of the Arrow for me? Stand up and Nice and loud so everyone can hear it. The mission of the Order of the Arrow is to fulfill its purpose as an integral part of Boy Scouts of America through positive youth leadership under the guidance of selected capable adults. So right there is a key thing. Have a starburst. 
a key thing right there is youth leadership. All of the youth over here, you guys are the leaders of this lodge. You're the ones who are going to lead the way under the guidance of select capable adults. And guidance is a very important word there because the adults aren't the ones running the show, the youth are. The adults are there to help advise them and help them succeed. So we have the mission of the OA. It gives us an idea of how the organization runs. Let's look at the mission of the lodge. Can I have someone read that for me? Come on, somebody, yeah. Um, the, mission of the, the mission of this lodge is to fulfill the purpose of the Order of the Arrow as an integral part of Boy Scouts of America through positive youth leadership under the guidance of selected capable adults. So the mission of the lodge is the same as the mission of our organization as a whole, except the lodge is serving the council. So now we have an idea of what our mission is. We have that idea that youth run the show and adults advise, but we don't know what we do yet, right? We're not, we haven't talked about that. So let's look at our purpose. Would someone like to read our purpose? I know it's a, a little small, so maybe someone up this way can read that for me. Come on, somebody. You look like you want to read it. Go for it. Yeah, just read the whole thing for me. Scattering the National Honor Society. Our purpose is to recognize those who best to exemplify the Scout Oath and Law in their daily lives, and through that recognition, cause others to conduct themselves in a way that warrants similar recognition. Promote camping, responsible outdoor adventures, and environmental stewardship as, as essential components of every Scout's experience in a unit year-round and in summer camp. Develop leaders with the willingness, character, spirit, and ability to advance the activities of their units, our brotherhood, scouting, and ultimately our nation. Crystallize the scout habit of helpfulness into a life purpose of leadership and cheerful service to others. So there's a lot of information there. It's kind of wordy, but from that, have some starburst, you can get an understanding of what lodges do, what our main operations as a lodge are. So that's our next topic here is lodge operations. What does a lodge do? So first up, one of the first lines of our purpose is about bringing together brothers and how do we get brothers into the order of the arrow? What? Inductions, elections, ordeals. The inductions process is exactly right. So that's one of the big jobs a lodge has, is to induct new members. The other one, the other big one is camp promotion. We are Scouting's National Honor Society of Honored Campers. The Order of the Arrow was created at a scout camp. Therefore, one of our main goals is to promote our council's camping opportunities, both year-round and summer camp. Leadership development. You see in there a line about you know, developing youth leadership skills. That takes a couple different uh, approaches. One is something like this, a lodge leadership development. A training session or multiple training sessions with the sole purpose of helping you guys succeed and become better leaders. But it's also not just training people to be leaders, but giving them the opportunity. All of you youth here have the opportunity to be leaders. There are lots of positions in your lodge, in your chapter, and in your units where you can lead. So the last one that lodge operations has to do with is cheerful service. This takes a couple different forms. You have cheerful service at camp where you're doing you know, service projects during a camp service weekend or during an induction, but then you also have community service projects in the community around your council. You know, that can take all sorts of forms in service, but that is one of the main purposes of our organization, is to provide service to others. For we are a brotherhood of cheerful service, right? So, the next thing we're gonna talk about, where do we fit? Matt mentioned that a lodge is like a council, and that is exactly right. On the right side there you have organization based for scouting for the Boy Scouts of America. 
from the national level all the way down to a scout or scouter. On the left side, you have how it's organized in the order of the arrow. So, both have a national level. Yeah, that's the National Council of the National Order of the Arrow. You have a regional level. We are part of the Northeast region of the Order of the Arrow. Then you have the section, which in the Boy Scouts is similar to the area. This right here is section NE3A. And then you get to the big part here, which is the lodge, which is similar to a council. Lodges are chartered one to each council, and they encompass that entire council and provide the Order of the Arrow pro program to scouts and scouters there. Within a lodge, though, you also have chapters, which is similar to a which is similar to a district, and then you have troops, etc. Now, how many chapters do you guys have? Zero. Zero. Okay. Neither does my lodge. Actually, we don't have a chapter system right now either. But you can drop it down further as your membership grows and as a lodge um, becomes more active. <laughs> But right now we're going to focus on the lodge level of things. So, you have this organization, you have this purpose, now how do we get anything done? How do you guys think we get this stuff done? How do we do it? Communication. Communication is how we do it, but who does it? You've got the five W's and the H, who, what, where, when, why, and how. So who is doing it? The youth. The youth the youth officers and their committees. So now I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about how your lodge is organized with your officers and your committees, okay? So the first thing you have is the lodge key three. Can I have the lodge chief stand up for me? The lodge advisor. Is the lodge staff advisor here? Excellent. These three people are your key three of the lodge. You have the head youth, you have his advisor, and you have the staff advisor. And they each serve a different purpose. Thank you guys, you can sit down. And so, on the next slide, I just have what each one does. The lodge chief is like a chairman of a corporation. He runs the lodge. The lodge advisor advises him and manages all the other advisors. So. You might have advisors for other positions in the lodge or advisors for chapters. The lodge advisor is the person that manages them and works directly with the chief. And your staff advisor is your liaison to the council. So when things need to get done like booking camp for a weekend or you know, paperwork to get your charter done, that is something the staff advisor takes on. So now let's look at the LEC. Who knows what the LEC is? You should know that. That's good. It is the Lodge Executive Committee. Some people call it um, just an executive committee, executive board. There's various ways to call, call it or name it. But it is the group of youth leaders that run the Lodge. So this is based on your Lodge's positions. Not all of them may be filled right now. But there's an opportunity here to fill every one of these. So on the left, my, on the right, my left, you have the advisors. You have a lodge advisor. You have his associates who may be advising other officers or just helping out. You have advisors of chapters if you have chapters. And you have committee advisors. And then you have your two professionals. You have the staff advisor and the supreme keeper of the fire who is your scout executive. The scout executive has the final say in anything related to the lodge. He's not doing anything with day-to-day -day operations, but when it comes down to it, the Supreme Keeper of the Fire you know, has a final say on things as the scout executive of your council. And then when you get to the other side, you have all of the different positions. And your lodge has a lot of them ready to be filled with people. I see a lot of youth in the room. And I see a lot of positions. And from what I've heard, they're not all filled, right? There's a lot of opportunities here. And so under each of those positions, you have different committees, different responsibilities. And this group makes up your LEC. Your LEC meets probably monthly. OK, so your LEC meets monthly. You're responsible for conducting the business of the lodge, making decisions, planning events. That is where the buck stops, is with the LEC. 
Now, something I want to mention that's not on here is the past lodge chief. The immediate past chief is also a part of the picture. When Chris is done with his term, or the chief before him, they can stay on the LEC and help guide the lodge into the future. And past officers are a great resource for you to use for you know, information to help you, you know, when you don't know what you're doing, they can help get you on the right path, give you guidance on problems they probably had as well. So we have an LEC, we have a purpose, we have you know, things we need to get done. How do we make sure they get done? Someone said it before, I think it was you. Communication. Why is communication important? Looking for some ideas. Why do you think communication is important? Um, like if you don't communicate, ideas don't get around and then nothing happens. Exactly. Nothing happens or things don't happen the way they're supposed to. Communication is a key to your success. Okay. I forgot I had this in there. These are all the committees in your lodge. As you can see again, like with all those positions, there are a lot of committees listed that your lodge can have. You don't need to have all these committees going, but you can. And these are opportunities to lead. If you see something up there you're interested in, you know, later, later in the day, sometime you know, in the next few weeks, talk to Chris, talk to your lodge chief, and look at becoming the chairman of that committee if it's not currently uh, being run, or join that committee if there's already a chairman. There's an opportunity here for you to do whatever you want in the lodge. There are so many different avenues you can take. Maybe you don't like uh, math, so you don't take finance up as your committee. Or maybe you like to write, so you take on communications. Maybe you're a great actor and you do ceremonies. You, whatever way you put it, there's a lot of opportunities here, and I highly recommend that everyone in here, you know, by the time we're done today, has an idea of what they want to do in the lodge. How are you going to make this lodge better? So now we're going to talk about communication. This is going to be one of our big topics of this session. As I said, we've looked at what needs to get done and who is going to do it, but it's not going to happen if no one communicates it. If no one talks to each other, no one figures out what's got to get done and when it's going to be done, there's not going to be a lodge. Miscommunication is a way to fail. Effective communication will make you successful, but poor communication will cause you to fail. Now, a key point with communication is that every effective communication, every email, every text message, every phone call has both someone who's sending the message and the person receiving it. This is a communication model that's used in a lot of different things. But if both people aren't paying attention and you know, getting that communication and acting upon it, then it's still failure. If I send Mitchell an email and he leaves it there for three weeks when I had something he needed to do this week, that's a failure because he didn't read my email and respond to it. Now maybe email wasn't the best way to get a hold of him. How many of you youth here use email frequently? Okay, more than I see normally. A lot of times uh, kids will tell me they don't check their email or emails for old people, things like that, and it's, you have to work with that. For advisors, it's important to figure out what the best way to communicate with your uh, youth committee chairman or officer says. For the youth, for you guys, it's important to look at what the best way to communicate between each other and between your advisors is. So, the next thing here is how do we communicate? I've got a whole list. You have snail mail. Some people do still send letters and postcards and notes. Email, that's a pretty common one. A lot of people in here said they use it. For the youth, how many of you normally uh, pick up a phone when you need to get a hold of someone? You make a phone call. S surprisingly, again, more than I thought I'd see. It's mostly a last ditch effort. A last ditch effort. Yeah. I hear that a lot. What? Or if they're not paying attention. Yeah, it's a way to get a hold of someone when they're not responding to your emails. See so a phone, text messages. How many of the youth in here text on a regular basis? Have phones that receive text messages? Okay. But I see some of you don't. And we'll get to that in a minute. 
you have instant messages, so I know a lot of people like to you know, communicate via Facebook chat, you know, Google chat. I don't know if anyone still uses AIM, but I put it on there just in case someone does out there. But there's a lot of different instant messengers that you can use to communicate. And of course, my favorite is smoke signals. <laughs> Easiest way to get a message across. I'm kidding. I thought I'd see who's paying attention. I saw a few smirks. I noticed you don't have talking face. Talking face to face? Yeah. You're right. You know, I didn't even, I was thinking about ways I communicate with someone when I'm not with them. Oh, right. But that's a good point. And it's important to note that face to face communication is the best way to convey a message the way you want it, to get feedback immediately, and to get something done. Sometimes sending emails or making a phone call isn't going to get the event planned. It's not going to, you know, recruit a lingamet. Sometimes you have to go have a face to face meeting. And that's one of the main reasons we have LECs. We could just as easily have a teleconference, get everyone on a phone call, have our LEC there, no one has to drive anywhere. But that face-to-face -face element allows it to be more personal. It allows us to immediately receive feedback and we don't have to worry about, well, what if his phone cuts out? Or what if the signal's bad? You eliminate all of that stuff and you get right down to what you need to do. So. What is the best way to communicate? You really have to figure out the situation. Every situation uses a different method of communication. So if I need to get a hold of my lodge chief for something, maybe the easiest way there is to send him a text or you know, shoot him a Facebook message. But if I need to talk to my advisor about something, let's say my advisor doesn't text, I should send him an email. It's all about the situation. I highly recommend for the youth in here that if you become a member of the LEC, when you become a member of the LEC or a committee, that you work with um, the people on your committee or the rest of the LEC and find out what their preferred method of communication is. For my lodge, we have a spreadsheet with everyone's uh, contact info on it. And we have a column next to their email and their phone number and such that says preferred contact method. And we just put in whether they'd rather receive an email whether they want you to just text them or if they'd rather get a phone call. And that way we know when it comes down to you know, crunch time and we need to get a hold of Johnny Arrowman to put together a ceremony, we know that Johnny doesn't have a phone that receives texts and we need to give him a call so that he can get this done for us. That is one of the biggest reasons that your communication falls on deaf ears because you're using the wrong channel. Some people use different means of communication and knowing that, being upfront about how you want people to communicate with you is the best way to make sure that that communication makes it. I also have up there formal versus informal communication. What do you guys think that means? What's a formal situation when we're talking about communication? Contacting an adult. Contacting an adult. Now what is something else you should do when you're contacting uh, an adult if you're under the age of 18? True, you should use uh, courtesies like that. Um, something I'm thinking of is related to youth protection, and it's just copy another advisor. One of the things we uh, work with when we're talking about youth protection is uh, no one-to-one -one contact. So sending an email to one person, one adult, from a youth, you should really co copy another advisor so you have you know, two people seeing that email. It's just a good practice to follow. And that way, usually if you're sending emails to an advisor, there's someone else who should be in the know as well. Like if I'm the ceremonies chairman and we're working on planning the ceremonies for the induction, maybe the inductions advisor or the inductions chairman needs to know about that too. So usually you want to think about who else should be copied on an email. So we have sending an email, what other situations warrant more formal contact with someone? You know, making, rather than a, a text written in shorthand, Come on, think a little bit. I know it's early in the morning. Snail, Snail mail. That is a, a very good example of where something, you're communicating in a formal manner. Something like an invitation to an event. How many of you uh, still get like you know, a newsletter in the mail from the lodge or other groups? Does your lodge still do a, a mailed newsletter? I don't think so. Okay, do you do mailings regularly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but that's something to consider is when you're communicating with your LEC, it's probably going to be quickest to send an email or you know, give someone a call, then send them a letter. But the next thing I want to mention is external communication. External communication is going to be something I'll talk about in a moment. I forgot what order my slides are in a little bit. It's one of those mornings. Follow-up is a big thing when we're talking about communication. A little later in the session, we're going to talk about time management and you know, assigning tasks. But one of the biggest reasons tasks don't get completed is because there's no follow-up on them. You, you know, assign Chris a task. I tell Chris he needs to go and recruit 10 Alingamets for the ordeal in three weeks. But I don't follow up with him. I don't call him you know, a week, two weeks out from the event and say, hey, have you recruited them yet? And then we show up Friday night and there's no Alingamets because Chris forgot about it and I forgot about it. And so we're both at fault. Following up is something that's not so hard. It just takes an email or a phone call, and it can do a lot of good to keep people on track and make sure that things get done. I know for me, I do a lot of different projects, and sometimes I forget about something that uh, has an impending due date, or I get off track, and it helps to get an email or a phone call or a text message from the person I'm working with saying, hey, you know that's due this Friday. How are you doing on that? It also allows you to adjust when things are due. So let's say you're working on a Lodge newsletter and you find out a week before you're supposed to print it and mail it that nothing's been put together yet, it's behind. Well now you know that you have to adjust when you want that to go out. You can make any changes and you're not doing, you know, you're not all ready to put together a mailer the day comes and you don't have anything ready for it. So follow-up communication is one of the big ways to keep things on track. It is how you will get your tasks done. Communicating effectively, following up with people, it's an easy way to make sure that the work gets done and no one you know, shows up in an event or you know, gets ready to send out a mailer and nothing's done for it. So now the next thing is external communication. We have communicating within the LEC, within the LOD, within our officers and our committee chairman. These are guys that are engaged. They're working in a position. They want to help the lodge. Chances are they're going to show up to events and do things like that. But when we have an event, we have to promote it. You can't have an event without any people there, right? You know, it's not going to be any fun at your lodge fellowship if only the LEC shows up and you don't have any other members or anyone there. If you have an induction weekend and you forgot to invite the candidates. There's not going to be much of an induction if there's no candidates. External communication is where that comes in. <laughs> yeah. I hope not. You have a couple different routes. You can use social media. I know you guys have a Facebook page. There's a Twitter account for your lodge. And those are great ways to connect with your younger members, with guys your age, some adults that are more connected. It's a Good way to get things out there quickly and with little to no cost. Really no cost in most cases for publishing on Facebook and Twitter. Then you have a website. Some cost involved there. If you're hosting the site yourselves or you have to pay for a domain name or something, there's a minimal cost, but it's a good way to get a lot of information out to a lot of people without much effort on your part. All you have to do is publish it and everyone can go and view it. You don't have to you know, mail it to them. But that's still on there because you start to lose parts of your lodge if you don't, you know, send any mail. There's probably um, older members of the lodge that don't, that aren't as connected. I'm, am I right for the advisors? There's got to be some people that aren't as connected in your lodge that would rather get a, a mailer with the event information than get an email. It's the case in most lodges at least. And you don't want to drop those people off. They're still a source of you know, membership. If they still want to be active, give them the chance and put that out there. What my lodge does is we mail out um, stuff before every big event. We have three big events a year. We have uh, two induction weekends and a fellowship. And so rather than sending mailings every month or every two months, we do three a year before each event. 
and that gives us an opportunity to put out the event information, you know, recent newsletters or news, and you know, like dues forms in January. So we still get those members who aren't as connected, who aren't checking our website or getting our emails. And we also get paper copies in everyone's hand of the event information. You have email, which is another easy and free way to put information out. It's important though that you collect emails that are valid. I know it's a problem for a lot of lodges. It's been a problem for me as a lodge secretary to get a list of emails from my lodge and then have half of them bounce back to me as not deliverable. So when you go to collect emails for a committee or for an LEC for contact information, make sure you ask that person to verify and make sure that's valid. And when you're looking at your lodge as a whole, it's a good idea to collect that information you know, on a regular basis so that you get updated info if it's changed. Things like email and phone number. People do change emails, they do move. Keep that info updated. And of course a phone call. Nothing works better to get people into an event than a good old fashioned phone tree. How many of you guys have ever done that? Less this time. <laughs> it's not something that people do, will use as much anymore, but it's very effective to get on the phone with someone and tell them about the event you're having. It is a great way to get people to an event, and it's a chance to make direct contact with them. They can't just shove it off like an email. So, we've talked about communication and what a lodge does and who's doing it. Now where are they doing it? Where does the business of the lodge get conducted? We've mentioned this before a little bit. Who has some ideas of where lodge business gets conducted? When do we get our work done? Someone said it before. Could it be the LEC meetings? It is your LEC meetings. And so I want to talk briefly about meetings. How do meetings work? How should you handle this? When you're talking about LEC meetings, usually you're meeting monthly or sometimes less frequently depending on the lodge, but set a standard schedule. Make sure that you schedule meetings on a regular basis and make it standard so that people can plan on it. They can know that the last Sunday or the second Tuesday or the third Friday of the month is going to be an LEC meeting at a certain location and time. That way people plan on it. Now the problem there is if you're telling everyone that your meetings are regularly going to be on the last Saturday of the month, what if you have to change one? What if you cancel a meeting? Then we have to go back to that communication phase and you have to tell them. We've had that happen um, with my lodge where we canceled a meeting and it wasn't communicated as well to the whole lodge and some people showed up. They drove two hours to the scout office for a meeting that wasn't happening. And they weren't happy because they had planned on a meeting, they were there, and no one else was. So keep that in mind when you're doing your planning that you keep everyone in the know. Communicate well. Communication is the key. The other thing with meetings is adopting a standard format for an LEC meeting. When you run an LEC meeting, you usually want to follow the same format every time. This way you can have a productive meeting. You don't sit around a table for two hours bickering over what kind of ice cream to serve at the end of the induction. You instead get to the bigger topics of the lodge, like JTE, like planning the induction weekend as a whole, service projects and things like that. The way my lodge does it, and I know, you know a lot of groups run things, is we handle it with starting the meeting with committee reports, a review of the past meetings minutes, which are submitted by our secretary, and then we move on to old business and new business. I'm not saying that's what you have to do for your lodge or your committee. Follow a format that works for you, but have a format. Have an agenda. When you come into a meeting, don't walk in, okay guys, what do we need to talk about? I don't know what's coming up, but let's, let's have a meeting, let's talk. You won't get anything done. And I promise you it'll be a painful experience because you'll either be pulling teeth the whole time to get anything out of your officers, or people are just gonna have so many different unrelated ideas that have nothing to do with what's the next thing you need to get done that you'll have a bad time. So it's all about the planning there. The other thing that you may need to do, 
It may not be as necessary with a smaller group, but if you have a larger lodge, you may want to adopt some rules of order. You can use parliamentary procedure, you can use Robert's rules of order, use whatever you want. Just have a standard plan for how a meeting is going to run. Who's going to open the meeting? How are motions going to be made? You know, is someone going to make the motion at the table there, or does it have to be submitted in advance? How does it work to second a motion, etc.? How does closing a meeting happen? Just have a plan for how you want to handle that. You can do it any way you want, but make sure it's planned. That way when you come into that meeting, you're ready to go. That takes us to the second point there is be prepared. Don't walk into a meeting without an agenda and without a plan and expect to get anything done. It just won't happen. It won't be worthwhile for anyone. We talk about this with youth under the guidance of adults. The youth are running the meeting. And I like the way we have things set up here today. We have the youth over here towards where our projector is and where I have a whiteboard and where I'm teaching from. And the adults are kind of off to the side, there to provide guidance, but not directly involved. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of blend in. So. <laughs> but something you may want to look at for meetings is to have the adults sit towards the back of the room, have them sit off to the side at another table, so that way the youth can run the meeting and the adults can add comments or advice when necessary. It's not a good idea to have your adult advisors at the table with you because what will happen is, you know, not because you want to cause trouble, but everyone wants to give their comments and their advice, but this is a place for the youth to take control. We like to say the chief drives the car, but the advisor buys the gas. The chief is the one who's driving the lodge forward. The advisor keeps the car from crashing and spinning out of control. You guys have the keys. Today we're going to give you some more tips, some more tricks, and we hope you'll take those and be successful. Something else I didn't put up here but I wanted to mention is using technology in your meetings to bring more people in. I know scheduling can be tough. I know the drives can be long. How far do some of you live from, uh, where do you guys usually hold your lodge meetings? Okay, so how long are the drives for most of you guys? <coughs> how long did you say? 45 minutes. Okay. 45 minutes, two hours. Two, two hours. A drive of two hours to an LEC meeting that's only gonna take an hour and a half can seem excessive for some people. And especially if the weather's not so great or people have another commitment that's you know, too close to the event, they may not be able to make it to the physical meeting. You have the opportunity here to use things like Skype, like a good old fashioned phone, put on speakerphone, and bring people into that meeting who aren't there. A lot of lodges have used things like Skype to great success so that airmen who can't be at the meeting, who may be you know, too far away from the location, or guys who are in college who are away at school, and let them have a part in what's going on. But don't let that be a fallback. Don't let that be the way to say, oh, I'm not really feeling driving half an hour to the LEC. I'll just Skype. I'll phone it in. Make sure attendance at meetings is a priority for the officers on your LEC, the members of your committees. If you make the meetings engaging, if you make them worthwhile and you make them fun, people will want to show up. Maybe you have, you know, you have the meeting in the afternoon and you start it with lunch. Or maybe afterwards you all go do something fun. Whatever it is, find a way to make those meetings something people want to go to instead of, oh, I have another LEC meeting today. Mm, I don't want to go to that. It's going to be long and boring. And this is something especially for all the youth. Because these are your meetings. You get to decide how they run. So why shouldn't you make them fun, right? So we've talked a lot about communication and how the lodge works. So we have all this stuff to do. We know who's doing it. And we know how they're going to figure out who's doing what by communicating, but we don't know when they're gonna get it done. So, the final topic of my session today is time 
management. I've done whole sessions on this, so I'm only going to you know, breeze through this a little bit. If you have more questions about how to manage your time better, please talk to me later. I'd be happy to share some of the ways I manage my time. And I'm sure our other trainers today would be happy to share their tips and tricks. But let's talk about the effects of stress. Because when you're busy and you don't manage your time well, and you're getting pulled in you know, 36 different directions, you tend to get stressed. So let's see, what are the effects of stress? You have sleeplessness. You have indigestion. You have overeating, irritability, damage to relationships, both family, personal, and friendships. You have ulcers, high blood pressure, heart disease, and lots of other health problems, all leading to, guess what? Yes. There we go, an early death. So, if you, don't, if you don't manage your time, if you don't take control of the stress in your life, you will die. <laughs> it's plain and simple. Uh, in 2011, I went to Summit Corps, and I was hanging out with another lodge chief there. I was a lodge chief at the time, and they had a, like a little blood pressure machine. Um, <laughs> I, had, I was in a pre-hypertension state at that time. It's tr troubling. <laughs> he, he had some full-on, like, serious blood issues. So don't end up like them. If you, manage your t if you manage your time well, you won't end up with health problems or you, know, you won't be stressed. When you have a task, when you have multiple tasks, you need to take them and you need to prioritize them. There's 10 different ways to do this. There's lots of different schools of thought on getting things done on task management. But the easiest way to do it is to start with prioritizing them based on when they need to get done. Do now, plan to do, and do in free time. Do now and plan to do are things you have to get done by a certain date. Some of them are more pressing, like a book report due tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And some of them are less pressing, like a plan for an induction weekend due in three weeks at an LEC. You categorize those and you plan on when you're going to do them based on their due date. And your doing free time items are things that you do for fun, that you want to do to enjoy yourself. Going to a movie, hanging out with friends, those sorts of things. You do them if you have time left over. If you're managing your time well, you'll have time left over. The two big ways to do this is to use a to-do list or a calendar. Personally, I like to use a to-do list. I break things out by project, by organization, and then I assign them all dates. I use the dates to know when they're due, and when I need to start working on them. Some people prefer to put things on a calendar. Uh, one of the groups I work with for OA Communications, we put all of our deadlines and our dates for things to be submitted or edited on a big Google Calendar. So it's shared with the whole team. Everyone has the ability to look at it. And we can all know when those dates are. There's no way for you to say, I didn't know the, the deadline for content submission was last night. Yes, you did. It was on the calendar. You saw it. It keeps people accountable if you make a list and you share it. If you don't follow up on tasks, if you don't you know, make a list for everyone to see, people can kind of cop out. They can, no, 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 you didn't say I was going to do that. Accountability is a big part of getting things done, especially if you have people that aren't as committed to the organization. Maybe they're new, maybe you know, they're very busy. If you use you know, methods to keep tasks in order, if you manage your time, you'll be able to get it all done. So, that's all I have. There's one more slide here which has some additional resources. How many of you have heard of the Guide for Officers and Advisors? Okay. I think it, your advisor has it right over here. It is downloadable from oa-bsa.org. There's a lot of great information in there for everyone involved with a lodge's LEC or committees. It has procedures and policies and a lot of guidelines on how you can run your lodge effectively. I highly recommend that as future officers that you all take a look at it at some point. Give it a read. It's not the most interesting content, but it is important. It's worthwhile to know. 
And your past officers and advisors are a big, a big, big resource. They've been there. They've done that. They've had the same issues you've had. We don't usually come up with, you know, huge big problems that are brand new. They've usually happened before and someone's had to deal with them already. And they can help you. They've had time in your shoes and they want to see you succeed. They want to see the lodge succeed. So don't be afraid to reach out to your past officers and advisors. So does anyone have any questions for me? We talked about how to manage a lodge. Leading successfully, I think we've covered aspects of it. Unfortunately, there's not enough time today to really go into how to lead. If you want to learn more about leadership and leading in a lodge or in a troop or in a community, I highly recommend you take uh, the National Leadership Seminar, which is a regional program offered. Uh, we'll be offering the next one in November at Camp Alpine. And you know what? Kyle, why don't you share with them real quick the detail that we learned last night from your scout executive about the um, transportation. Oh, right. Um, see which, if what's you guys, the date? Uh, what's the date of the NLS? 15th. 15th. Hop on. Transportation will be coming for you guys, which will be awesome. Here as I can, uh, down in it's uh, November 15th, 15th to 17th. 15th to 17th. You guys get all the information about it. It's down at Camp Alpine in New Jersey. What? <laughs> it is one of the best training programs I've ever gone through. Our other trainers have gone through it as well. I took it twice. <laughs> Can I just say something? I love it. Um, I highly recommend you went. I went three, two or three years ago. And not only do you learn a lot and you get to meet people from all around our region, even some people from around the country, but um, it's really fun. So I recommend it's it. A, it's a great experience. I highly recommend you do that. And it is one of the premier leadership courses. Um, it will give you an idea of how to lead. Today, our trainings are focusing on the nuts and bolts of running a lodge, of putting on program. NLS gives you the skills you need to put those programs and those operations into action. So does anyone have any questions for me? Just one other comment, um, if somebody wants to talk about, some, some of the youth have gone through NYLT mm -hmm. and they're worried, well, I did NYLT, should I do NLS? I would definitely do N NLS. It's a, NYLT is more focused on applying those leadership skills directly to a troop as a unit leader, as a youth leader in your unit, like an SPL or an ASPL. NLS gives you a really broad um, use of those leadership skills where you can apply them to any aspect of your life. You know, what you learn in NLS allows you to use those skills in your schools, in your communities, in groups you're involved in, and in scouting. So it's got a similar purpose, but it's a different program, and I highly recommend you, uh, you take that. It's taught by some of the most uh, skilled trainers in the order. And I believe Braden now has. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> There's a video he'd like to share with all of you. We're going to try this video out. Uh, let me just give a little bit of background on this video uh, before we show it. Uh, last night, uh, myself, Braden, and Mitch were talking about uh, you know, uh, elements we want to do in today's training. And uh, we started talking about your guys' lodge story, uh, Fox, right? So, uh, you know, we started talking about it, and uh, this video came out, I believe, yesterday? Uh, they came out on the 3rd. On the 3rd. Oh, okay, so a couple days ago. But um, this video is entitled Fox. Um, I think uh, if you guys really wanted to latch on to something uh, and really make a brand for yourselves, uh, watch this video real quick. Uh, personally, it's one of the most beautiful things I've seen in cinematography. Ow, 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 but there's no sound 
I could totally see you making one of these. Oh no! No! Oh! Oh, this is just a Oh, it gets better. It gets much better. I think this is going to be like an ongoing thing throughout the day, guys. If he can buffer the rest of the video. It's going to evolve throughout the day. With the All right, so there's part one of the video.